Now, I would like to close this first lesson, this first introductory lesson to the philosophy of risk. And I can guarantee you that all the different pieces of the puzzle will come together at the end of the course when we have the possibility of discussing all the details that we will consider together. Uh, okay, I want to close this first lesson by quickly describing some fallacies and biases that are commonly present when assessing risk. And these are, unfortunately, fallacies that often also experts uh, tend to uh, ignore, and they often fall into the different biases. So we will consider some of the most important ones. Later on during the course, we will add details about these ones and also about some other more technical ones, like, for example, the forecasting bias and the historical bias. The first type of fallacy is the so-called size fallacy, and is extremely common, even among experts. In these days, we are considering the very big problem of the COVID-19 pandemics, and every day in the media, on TV, you can listen to people that fall into the size fallacy. A common sentence that represents the size fallacy is the following, we must accept this or that technology since the risks are smaller than that of a meteorite falling down on your head. So in practice, in the size fallacy, one compares risks that cannot be compared. Risks are in fact not free-floating objects and unrelated risks should not be compared. You cannot compare the risk of pandemics with the risk of falling from ladders or being eaten by a shark. Some risks are one shot. Other risks can manifest themselves several times. Some risks are additive, others are multiplicative, and risks belonging to different tail classes, as we shall see, cannot be stupidly compared or, even worse, conflated. Finally, in taking decisions, we always have to consider not only risks, but also benefits. Another very common fallacy is the so-called ostrich fallacy. In the ostrich fallacy, we start from the wrong assumption that everything is detectable and measurable. We know that this is not true. There are many situations in which payoffs are not easily quantified, nor the probabilities. It is extremely dangerous to assume that if something does not present any detectable risk, then it cannot present any unacceptable risk. What if our way of measuring risk is limited? What if our model is wrong? If you are a little bit familiar with statistics, you know that, as a statistician, you are very much interested in type 1 and type 2 errors, also in type 3, but let's say that type 1 and type 2 errors are very important. So, when you are performing a test, you are interested in the significance level, you are interested in the power of the test, and all the related quantities. One fallacy that is connected to this type of reasoning is the proof-seeking fallacy, which also connects to a common saying that tells us that the absence of evidence should not be an evidence of absence. If there is no evidence about something being dangerous, then no action needs to be taken. Okay, this is an extremely common fallacy. Think about false negatives in statistical testing. We do not see an effect that actually exists. Being precocious is always a clever choice in front of this type of uncertainty. 
I already referred to this type of fallacy before when discussing time as one of the possible dimensions of risk, and it's now the time to consider the delay fallacy. The delay fallacy is extremely dangerous in risk management. You may fall into the delay fallacy because of good reasons, because you're actually looking for a solution and you want to be safe and sound with your solution, but then the result of falling into the fallacy are extremely dangerous. In the long run, we all are dead. Waiting too long is not necessarily the clever choice in risk management. In fact, in risk management, we have to take decisions under uncertainty and limited information. Always postponing waiting for more information may bring ruin. It does not mean that we have to rush, but it is important not to ignore that delays are often dangerous. Think about the COVID-19 pandemic. How much time have we wasted waiting for more data, for better data? How much time have governments wasted without taking into consideration the evidence coming from other countries because they were waiting for their own data and then they were not even able to collect those data? How many people could have been saved Sometimes it's very important to look at the trade-off between waiting too much and acting quickly. Being precocious and taking your decisions at an early stage very often can minimize the impact of the bad consequences that we want to avoid. Maybe early decisions are not the best ones and we can always intervene and improve decisions, but no decision is for sure worse than some imperfect decision. And waiting for the optimum sometimes just leads you to crying for the bad consequences because you did not intervene on time. There is an important and dangerous type of fallacy that can make you behave like a turkey. Do you really want to play the role of the turkey in the story? Here we can cite a little paragraph from The Black Swan, a famous book by my friend Nassim Taleb, a book that I strongly recommend. Consider a turkey that is fed every day. Every single feeding will firm up the bird's belief that it is the general rule of life to be fed every day by friendly members of the human race, looking out for its best interests, a politician would say. On the afternoon of the Wednesday before Thanksgiving, something unexpected will happen to the turkey. It will incur a revision of belief. Naively assuming that the past is an optimal predictor for the future is extremely dangerous. The new record observation, the new big maximum, is never among the past observations. Past only provides a lower bound for the future. As we shall see in most situations, and in finance in particular, the future is always fatter tailed than the past. And relying too much on the past, making the past the only source of information, is what we will call historical bias. The next fallacy is known as the technocratic fallacy. And from my point of view, it is very much related to an over-reliance on models and on the ignorance of the presence of model risk. As I will elaborate more in the course, a way of avoiding the technocratic fallacy is not only to deal with model risk in the proper way, but also to use heuristics. While it is true that risk quantification requires technical skills, as I already stressed several times, a good risk manager is 
and must be humble. She has doubts about her model. He is aware of situations in which risk is only partially accessible. An expert blindly relying on risk neutrality is not necessarily more effective than your grandmother's wisdom, especially if certain decisions have important societal impact. Strictly connected to the technocratic fallacy, we find the consensus fallacy and the infallibility fallacy. They are both related on some misconceptions with respect to the role of experts. Experts are human and they can be wrong. Sure, a real expert in her field is more reliable than the layman, but often experts do not agree, and this is often the case in science. Consensus and unanimity cannot be the new fetish. Finally, especially in finance, experts often follow rules and models critically. A little amount of skepticism is healthy. Be careful, I'm not saying that all experts are wrong and not reliable, and that we are all the same. The opinion of a neurosurgeon when speaking about the human brain is definitely more important than mine. But also a neurosurgeon can be wrong, especially on the frontier of research, and for sure when speaking about other fields. In medio stat virtus, the Latins used to say. And decisions that have a societal impact need to be discussed with all those involved. Experts have to suggest, have to make recommendations, but the final decision is a matter of democracy. As it will be clearer later in the course, in particular when we consider extreme value theory in lessons 3 and 4 and so on, uh, the technocratic fallacy but also all the other experts related fallacies, the fact that we often see models that are used without even asking if the parameters make sense, if the assumptions make sense, without stressing the models, without trying to understand the sensitivity and the robustness of the models, all these things are very linked to the problem of extreme risks that for us risk managers are more common than in other fields. A proper definition of extreme risk will be given in a couple of classes when we deal with extreme value theory, but very simply speaking, an extreme risk is something that can generate a very big impact for us, a very big negative impact, like a very large loss, and whose probability of happening is small but not negligible. So we really have to take into consideration that type of risk in our modeling. Even if we will see that under very basic models, like, for example, those imposed by the Basel framework, extreme risks are commonly ignored or very uh, much underestimated. Extreme risks are related to another interesting topic that we will discuss together, which is the topic of fat tails. We will say what a fat tail is, but essentially a distribution is fat tailed if its tail decay, decays as a power law, and that tells us that there is an interesting amount of probability in the tail that should not be ignored. Now, a very common mistake made by uh, people is that when they are considering a phenomenon that can generate extreme risks, they keep on focusing their attention on the standard quantities that we are used to use, that is to say, the mean, the variance, and all the quantities that are essentially related to the so-called bulk of the distribution. Now, in those situations, in reality, we will see that what is really meaningful for us, what really gives us information, what for uh, risk management purposes is important, is the tail. 
is the tail. That can be the left tail, the right tail, depending on the object we are playing with. But it's the tail. These are the situations in which using uh, an expression that Nassim Taleb and I have introduced in a paper, these are the situations in which it is not the dog that wags the tail, but it's the tail that wags the dog. Now, with this last thing, I close our first lesson. I hope you enjoyed that and see you in the next class.